Hi, good evening, and welcome to Conversations with the Candidates on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Gene Preuss with the League of Women Voters of the Houston area. Tonight we have a candidate for Houston City Council District I. And it's only one candidate, it's Robert Gallegos, and so thank you and welcome to the show. Uh, I think the uh, rain uh, has scared some people off, uh, and I don't blame them. We got stuck down here in Houston ourselves uh, yesterday. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming out and braving the weather. Uh, tonight we're going to ask you some questions, learn a little bit about you and your positions on some of the issues facing your district and the city at large. So let's start off by telling the viewers a little bit about yourself and why you're running for District I. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, again, I'm Robert Gallegos uh, representing District I. Uh, I've been in office now for five and a half years. I'm up for re-election. Um, I was born and raised in the East End. I'm the youngest of seven. My parents came from Mexico uh, back in the 1920s as young teenagers. Uh, um, and they, of course, married. Uh, and I was born at the uh, Parkview Hospital there that used to be there on 75th and Harrisburg. The building's there, but not the hospital. Uh, and I went to McLeod and Mary Elementary School, went to Edison Junior High School, uh, and uh, graduated from Stephen F. Austin High School. Um, again, I was raised in Magnolia Park. Um, I started, I guess, in the uh, getting, getting the bug of the political end of it uh, back when I was the uh, CYO president at McLeod and Mary. Uh, our uh, our uh, advisor, he was into politics back then. Uh, and uh, he basically was asking for volunteers to help him out and this was back old school when you had to print the signs and hammer the, the, the signs on the wooden sti uh, sticks and get splinters in your fingers and all that. Uh, so I got the bug then uh, and being the youngest of seven, my two oldest brothers they always kept telling me, why don't you run, why don't you run? Uh, so five and a half years ago, it was an open seat, and after being in the community, uh, community leader for 30-some years, president of my civic club for 15, founder and first president of the Eastwood Lawndale Super Neighborhood, chair of the Rufus Cage Educational Alliance, helped to form the Harrisburg uh, Rail Subcommittee. Uh, so with all that behind me, uh, I, as you know, not getting any younger, I felt like this was the time to try, uh, and thank God uh, my first try, and I got elected. So here I am. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want you, if you would, uh, let's let's look at District I. Could you walk us through District I and what District I represents and what some of the concerns of the district are? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm uh, one of the 11 district council members. Uh, and in, in District I, um, it, it represents downtown Houston, most of downtown Houston, except for the old post office and the courthouses, that's in District H, uh, but I have most of downtown. Uh, then I also represent Edo, East Downtown. Uh, I represent uh, most of the East End, except for the second ward area. Uh, the Hobby Airport area, <clears throat> which includes Glenbrook Valley, Park Place, and that area up in there. Uh, I also represent uh, uh, along, along the Port of Houston, uh, and then it goes up into Northeast Houston, over there off of Federal, I-10, Maxi Road, which would include El Dorado, Songwood, Wood Shadows, uh, that area up in there. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a large district, it's real, really diverse. Uh, but with that, nearly 80% of the residents in District I are Hispanic. Uh, so it uh, keeps me busy, keeps me and my staff very busy. I see. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room, and that is flooding. Mm -hmm. And I say that because um, yesterday, tropical storm, uh, Imelda really inundated the city. Uh, I've heard reports, and this is just what I've heard, that it may have been more rain in some areas than Harvey 
dumped on the city. And um, I was at University of Houston downtown yesterday in your district, mm -hmm. and we were stuck there for mm -hmm. several hours. Some of the students uh, I know were stuck there long into the evening. Some spent the night. So let's talk about flooding. What are some of the pressing issues affecting District I? And if reelected, what steps can you take to address those issues? Okay. Well, oh, first of all, uh, U of H downtown is actually in District H. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, by far, District I, we did pretty well uh, during Hurricane Harvey. Uh, granted, there were some homes that did, did get impacted with flooding. Uh, with, with the storm that we just recently had, same thing. Uh, by far, the uh, district did pretty well. Uh, but with that, I'm with the mayor and city council. We're working to try to get funding from, of course, from FEMA, uh, from the feds, so we can help to uh, rebuild some homes uh, and, and put people's lives back together. Uh, we are also working with the state to try to get more funding from the Rainy Day Fund. Uh, but w we did pass an ordinance in regards to the uh, new, new construction uh, that, you know, the uh, new structure has to be lifted off the ground. Uh, to try to prevent flooding. Uh, so unfortunately that was just done just a few months ago. Uh, so we haven't really seen the impact on that. It's gonna take a while. Uh, but that's one thing that we did try to address uh, to try to help the, uh, in the future where homes won't get flooded like they have in the past. Uh, so that's one step that we have undertaken. Well, other than flooding, what are some of the other issues that you see in District I? An issue that we do have right now is in District I is that we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the only district <clears throat> in, in the city that I can say I have all three existing light rail lines in my district. The red line comes through downtown, the purple line uh, uh, comes through downtown, and the green line downtown through the east end. Uh, so all three light rail lines come through District I. Uh, and with that said, I know that Metro has on the referendum coming November, Metro next. Uh, so one issue that I've been working with Metro and with the community is the extension of the Green Line uh, to Hobby Airport. Um, there was three options for Metro. Uh, one of the options was possibly taking the light rail line down Harrisburg where it ends at the Magnolia Transit Center. Uh, but uh, before we would get to the Magnolia Transit Center or after the Magnolia Transit Center, it would go up 75th Street. Uh, to the backside of Gulf Gate, and then back there on Telephone Road, they would hook it up to the Purple Line, and then it would be one track all the way to Hobby. Uh, when I found out about that, I made sure that Metro knew that I did not support that uh, due to the fact that we have a master plan at Mason Park. Uh, we've met with the community, and we have a master plan, uh, and if it would have gone up 75th, in my opinion, it would have taken green space from Mason Park. Uh, it would have also built an overpass there. There's a uh, Union Pacific Railroad underpass, uh, there's an underpass, vehicular underpass, uh, right there by Mesa Park. They would have built a, a overpass to go over that railroad track. Uh, um, and then further up by Gr Griggs Road, they would have built another overpass to get over those railroad tracks. Uh, so that would have destroyed, in my opinion, that would have destroyed uh, the East End, divided it. Uh, so I was opposed to that, and we had a we had a meeting with the Eastwood Lawndale Super Neighborhood, and the vast majority of individuals at that meeting also agreed that they did not want it to go down 75th. So when Metro voted to place the uh, referendum on the ballot uh, about three weeks ago, uh, now they're looking at taking it up Broadway or Harrisburg Broadway, and then I've asked once it gets to the Gulf Freeway if they can go down Park Place and then to Reveille Telephone and hook up the purple line there, and then it would be one track to Hobby. Uh, so even though that's not set in stone, uh, but now they're considering going that route. Well, th this brings up a very important question. Uh, let's talk about transportation. With a lot of the downtown area, and you, you know, you're talking about the Metro Rail and the Metro Next uh, initiative, uh, tell us about transportation issues in District I. Well, transportation issues in District I that we're having right now, of course, is like I just explained, the uh, light rail line extension to Hobby. Uh, the other issue that we're having right now is the realignment of 45 that's going to be behind the George R. Brown Convention Center. I made it perfectly clear to TxDOT and to the mayor, and the mayor agrees, uh, that we 
we need to make sure we don't lose connectivity from downtown to the east end. Uh, because when they realign the freeway behind the George R. Brown Convention Center, right now we, we, we have Leland, we have Polk, uh, we have um, somewhat of Canal Street going into downtown, even though now you have to, it's not, it's not a straight through into downtown anymore. Uh, so I want to make sure we don't lose the connectivity that we have. So I've been working with Public Works uh, and with the uh, 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 TxDOT to make sure that we don't lose that connectivity and we're supposed to be having a follow-up community meeting uh, sometime in October so they can give us an update. Uh, but I'm hoping we can turn Leland into a two-way going into downtown and out of downtown and then uh, uh, Franklin Street hopefully turn that back into a two-way in and out of downtown and that way you have connectivity on the south side of downtown and on the north side of downtown uh, and therefore the east end won't lose that connectivity so we're still working on that and I'm hoping that we will be successful. Okay so one of the other issues that uh, this brings up um, and I'm just piggybacking on, on your response um, talking about transportation and talking about Metro Rail uh, and the 45, uh, all of these things are, you know, there's been some talk in the newspaper about the 45 issue mm -hmm. and whether or not it's a good idea to broaden 45 or not. What does your district think about this? What, are the, what do your constituents think about this idea to broaden 45, to widen 45? Well, there's mixed feelings about it. Uh, I mean, there's some people that are okay with it, but they just want to make sure that, of course, they, it won't cause any flooding on the new section of 45. Uh, so we need to st stay on top of that. Um, uh, and then there's others that may not, that don't want that realignment behind the George R. Brown Convention Center. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm, you know, as you know, the city is growing. Uh, there's people that are constantly coming in every week to the city of Houston. Uh, and we have to address our transportation needs. Uh, but I know that myself and some other council members, uh, we did ask Metro that when they do the, uh, the widening of 45 on the north side, uh, that they include the uh, HOV lanes, uh, HOV lanes and for a hopefully a bus rapid transit uh, uh, designated lane. Uh, so that way, hopefully that will go uh, all the way to the Intercontinental Airport. Uh, because to do light rail all the way to the kind of airport won't make any sense due to the fact that you're going to have a lot of stops. And when people are trying to catch their flight, they do not want to be stopping, you know. Uh, so that won't work to do light rail all the way to the continental airport. So it's either a commuter rail, if that would be possible, but who knows if that can be done. Uh, but right now, if they're going to be widening 45, let's plan ahead and put designated uh, a lane for a bus rapid transit. Uh, that way you may have three or four stops from downtown Intercontinental. Um, and, and, and that's something that we are working uh, to try to make sure that hopefully Textile will do something like that along with Metro. I'm gonna change gears a little bit here now. Uh, so you, you've lived in, in Houston all your life. And, yes. Um, it's changed a lot from when you were young. So today, Houston is a very diverse city. We make uh, a, a lot of uh, boast about how diverse we are and how we represent the United States and that we're about to be the third largest city in the United States. How are you going to work to communicate with a diverse population like that in your role and in your district, which may not be, uh, may not have all of those uh, different diversities in it, but there are a lot of diverse people living in District I. So how are you gonna communicate with them and represent that constituency? The way, uh, as you stated, Houston is the most diverse city in the nation and we're soon going to be the third largest city. Um, and the mayor has mentioned many times, we have about 140 some languages that are spoken in the city of Houston. Uh, so with that, I, my door is op always open at, 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 at City Hall in regards to whoever calls my scheduler, uh, you know, I'll, I'll meet with them. Uh, no matter what the issue is, what the concern is, uh, if they want to see me, I will meet with them uh, and try to address it. Uh, as an elected official, that is my responsibility uh, and I don't take that lightly and I, I'll go out of my way to make sure I meet with them. 
Uh, so, you know, being whatever race or nationality or, or, or whatever the, the case might be, uh, my office is always open and I will be always listening to whoever has a concern or an issue with the city. We have a census coming up, mm -hmm. and there have been a lot of uh, controversies uh, over the census asking about citizenship. How do you think the census is going to change uh, District I? Because after the census, then, of course, comes redistricting. Do you think that's going to affect District I very much? I'm concerned due to the fact that um, it's the... Uh the administration that we have up in Washington, the administration that we have in Austin, I mean, as you know, the, uh, the state legislator uh, passed uh, SB4. Uh, SB4 was something that I led the charge with uh, at city council, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to get the city to join the lawsuit with San Antonio and Dallas and El Paso against the state trying to, 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 to prevent SB4 from going into effect. Uh, even Chief Acevedo made it perfectly clear that uh, he, he was concerned if SB4 went into effect. Uh, this is the law where the police officer can stop someone and ask them for their documentation. Uh, so the East Side Division actually has uh, Alianza Contra el Crimen, which is the Alliance Against Crime. Uh, they go out into the community, mostly to the parks, community centers, uh, and they bring a lot of their uh, equipment and, and, and other departments from within HPD. Uh, so that way residents can go and, and tour and see these, the, these pieces of equipment and what have you. Uh, so that way they can feel more comfortable and confident that the police is there to help, uh, you know, not to arrest them because they may be undocumented. Uh, so it's things like this that we're having to do because of the laws that are passed. Uh, and I fear that uh, because of these, this law, uh, uh, when uh, they're, they're actually out going to get the forms filled out for the census, people will be afraid. Uh, and, and that's why we've just recently approved funding for Lopez Negrete Communications uh, to take the lead uh, to try to get information out to the community to let them know that do not fear uh, answering the census. You know, citizenship is not asked uh, in regards to if they're documented or not documented. Uh, so we need to make sure that we get everyone counted because a lot of this funding that comes from the feds depends on the census. Uh, and if we don't get people counted, then we're actually going to be losing funding from the feds. Right. I was I was just going to ask you, you know, um, I don't know that everybody, that people understand why census is important to cities. You think, well, you know, we've got millions of people living here in Houston. We are so large. What are a few dozen people going to, if we don't count everybody, uh, how, you know, what does that matter? But it, it does, and I know that there's even efforts, I think, to, to count uh, people without homes, uh, some of the homeless population. Mm -hmm. I, I, I may have my numbers wrong, but I think the mayor said if, a, if, if we miss counting an individual, that's about, I think it was like $1,300 that we, we would be l uh, missing out on. So if you can imagine the, if it's a good number of individuals that we fail to count, uh, that's fed money that's coming that could have came into Houston for you know for clinics and roads and 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 and, and, and uh, other services that the that the city can provide. Uh, so that's why it's very important that uh, we make sure that everyone is counted. I know that I restarted the uh, nonprofit uh, Latino organization. Uh, we meet quarterly. Uh, the last time we met, we didn't meet over the summer, but the last time we met, uh, we actually w was a discussion about the census. Uh, to let people know that we need everyone's help to make sure that people are aware of the sentence and the, and the importance of getting it filled out. Uh, we're going to have a follow-up meeting uh, hopefully in November, uh, October, November, possibly after the election. Uh, so that way, again, we can give another follow-up meeting regarding the census. Uh, but uh, as you stated, it's going to also uh, depend on the redistricting from the census numbers. So. Uh, that's possibly maybe more congressional uh, uh, representation uh, from, from the city of Houston going to, to Washington. So let me, uh, I'm going to change gears here again. There's a lot of people on city council. There's 16 seats. And each represent different parts of the city. Each have their own concerns. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about District I's concerns. So if reelected, um, how are you going to work with all of the different personalities. I know you already do now, but how do you continue to work with different personalities? Some of those may change to best represent District I. Well, in the city of Houston, we have a strong mayor form of government. 
so uh, it, it's up to the mayor to place something on the agenda. Uh, so you need to work with the mayor, you need to work with your council members. Uh, but with that said, I mean, I do represent District I, so uh, you know, I, 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 I fight for District I to make sure that we get our fair share. Uh, but you know, you, you need to also be diplomatic uh, when you're working with your colleagues uh, to make sure you get their support when there's something on the agenda uh, that, that, that uh, you're, you're hoping gets passed. Uh, so I, in the five and, year, five and a half years that I've been in office, I have not had a problem uh, working with my colleagues or with the mayor. Uh, so I look forward to the next four years doing the same. You know, in Houston, we want economic development. We were talking about some of this a little bit earlier, uh, but we also want to preserve our quality of life. We want to have a good, mm -hmm. uh, a good city that we're proud to call home, that we're proud to go home to every day. Um, but sometimes people don't think that those are compatible desires. Right? We want business. There's no zoning in Houston, so sometimes we get businesses we're not happy with. Um, how do we maintain a balance? We want a, a good city, a profitable city. We want a good quality of life. How do we maintain that? Well, in District I, you know, uh, in regards to quality of life, uh, that, that the, the first thing that I worked on when I became a council member five and a half years ago, there was the big controversy about Gus Wortham Golf Course there in the East End. Uh, at that time, Mayor Parker was the mayor. Uh, and the uh, community was divided. Uh, in regards to refurbishing the old golf course or, or turning it into a botanic garden. Uh, so I live about a block and a half away from, the, from Gus Wortham Golf Course. And, uh, you know, I, again, being an elected official, it's my responsibility to listen to my constituents. So I kept my word in the sense that once I was elected, uh, my office was open. And I heard from both groups uh, from January all the way through May or so, uh, we had people coming into my office. Uh, and they were presenting their vision. Those that wanted to refurbish Gus Wortham, which is the oldest 18-hole golf course in the state of Texas, and those that wanted to turn it into a botanic garden. Uh, and after, after these several months of listening to the community, it was obvious that the majority wanted to save the golf course. Uh, so I, I worked with my colleagues, I worked with the mayor, uh, and when we voted on it, it was a unanimous vote, vote to save the golf course. Uh, but with that said, I, I, I tell people I was selfish. I didn't want to lose the Botanic Garden. Uh, so I, I met with the Botanic Garden and I met with some community leaders over there by the Hobby Airport area. Uh, there's the old Glenbrook Golf Course. They're off a of park place in the Gulf Freeway. And I asked the Botanic Garden if, board if they would be interested in going to Glenbrook Golf Course. Uh, after they went and looked at it, they said yes. So, uh, so now we got the best of both worlds. We have a refurbished Gus Wortham golf course. Uh, we have the Botanic Garden that's working at the old Glenbrook golf course. And this is over $50 million of private money coming into two green spaces that the city did not have any money to refurbish. Uh, and what really, got, what really got my attention about the Botanic Garden is that I had never been to a Botanic Garden. So when I was trying to make all this decision, I went up to Dallas to see their Botanic Garden. And what really impressed me was there was, a, it's an, of course, a nonprofit, so they have a lot of volunteers. Uh, so they had a lot of seniors that were actually volunteering and they had their nice little vests. Uh, and you could just tell from, the, from their facial expression how proud they were uh, to have something to do. Uh, and that's what I'm looking for is that our Botanic Garden will also have volunteers like seniors that will come in and have something to do during the day at a beautiful Botanic Garden. You mentioned volunteers, I, and I know uh, from previous conversations I've had with you, you've, uh, and you alluded to this earlier, you were very active in civic. Can you talk, uh, civic functions, can you talk about that background that you have and, and why that was uh, important to you? Yes, uh, again, I, I got active back when I was in the uh, uh, CYO at Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, the, our advisor again was very active in politics and he was asking us to help him vol you know, to volunteer with candidates that he was supporting. Uh, so with, with that said, I mean, I, I just got that bug. And uh, so when, when, when I moved into Country Club, uh, where I live now, right off of Lawndale and Wayside, uh, I, I became active with, their, with the Civic Club there. Uh, in, 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 in where I was president of the Civic Club for 15 years. 
uh, and founded the Eastwood Lawndale Wayside Super Neighborhood. Uh, before that, I mean, even though you had uh, Eastwood, you had a country club, you had Idlewood, and you had East Lawndale, and they're right next to each other, we didn't really communicate with each other until we formed a super neighborhood, and then we had a representative from these different neighborhoods where they could tell us issues they were having, concerns they were having, and we could share, share information. Uh, and then with the, East, the, uh, 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 the Rufus Cage Educational Alliance, it's an old building at 1417 Telephone Road that was dedicated back in 1911. HISD owned it, and when I was president of the Super Neighborhood, I saw this big for sale sign on the fence. So I called our trustee at that time, Juliet Stepech, and I asked her, I see this property's for sale. Is, is HISD going to sell it to whoever they sell it? it? Guarantees that they're going to save this old building. And she said, no. Uh, so we formed the Rufus Cage Educational Alliance. Uh, we got a bus and we had a whole bunch of, we, we, we filled up the bus and we went to HISD and uh, we asked them to save this building and Mayor Parker at that time worked out a deal with HISD and uh, so now we have this building there uh, and uh, Mayor Parker put a brand new roof on it. Uh, now as a council member I was able to work with Mayor Turner and we have it on our CIP this year. Uh, 1.5 million dollars so now what my vision is is to turn that into an educational hub uh, where maybe we have project grad uh, you know and, and other uh, or, uh, educational organizations that will office there uh, because you have Austin High School you have Eastwood Academy you have Yolanda Black Navarro Middle School you have Kip Academy uh, so if we can have an educational hub there providing services for our students I think it's going to be a win-win for everyone. So I've just been active in the community for 30-some years, and now as a council member, I'm not taking it lightly, and I'm trying to work to make sure that we move District I forward. So let me uh, circle back around. Um, why are you the best candidate for District I, and how can people learn more about your campaign? Well, first of all, they can go to uh, VoteRobertGallegos.com. Uh, has uh, information in, in regards to who I am, what I have accomplished. Uh, you know, again, th this is something in the past five and a half years that I'm running on my record um, in, in regards to moving District I forward. Uh, we've accomplished a lot in five and a half years. Uh, and the reason why I'm running and why I feel like I'm the best candidate is because of my record. Uh, uh, these past five and a half years. And not only that, I mean, you can go back 20, 30 years from, 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 from today and, 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 and see that I've been active in the community. Uh, and there's a lot more to do, and I'm hoping to keep working and moving District I forward in the next four years. Uh, and and, and, and my, again, my record speaks for itself. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank you for coming out, uh, even though it was a little bit rainy, mm -hmm. uh, and coming down to Houston Media Source TV studios, answering our question. It helps us become, not only learn more about you, but it also helps us to become better voters. Every year, the League of Women Voters of the Houston area publishes its Voter's Guide. Now, this guide is where we ask candidates from all the different elections on city council, uh, the at-large positions, we asking uh, HISD candidates and HCC candidates and also the uh, candidates for the upcoming Texas House District 148 special election. We are asking them a series of questions. They respond to that and then we print those up and make them available. Not only in print, but they're also on our website. They're going to be on our website. Uh, that's lwvhouston.org, and it's also going to be available on our 411 app. It should be out in a few weeks in mid-October before early voting begins. It's available in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese. Uh, also, if you go to our website right now, you can get our handy-dandy voter's guide. Uh, with the changes in elections this year uh, that you could vote anywhere, there, people always have questions about voting and about elections. The handy-dandy voter's guide addresses some of those uh, questions you may have, and uh, you can also find it on our website, lwvhouston.org. In just a few days, this video will be available on YouTube. We're going to post it on uh, the uh, our League of Women Voters channel, and you can also find it on our Facebook page, LWB Houston. Thank you very much for coming out tonight again, Robert Gallegos, and thank you for watching. 
I'm Gene Preuss for the League of Women Voters of the Houston area. Thank you for joining us on Conversations on the, with the Candidates on Houston Media Source TV. Have a good night. Thank you.